No, but we just, I said, uh, okay, but more, you also said more that, tubulins. you said that, uh, right, the, the brain's using more of its neurons. And more microtubules. This, well, because each each neuron right. has more has microtubules within right. it. So if it uses more neurons, it's also using more microtubules. Right. But you said also that each one is producing the uh, computations faster. No, the because you have more, you're going to reach thresholds. Okay, faster. so each individual one of them is it's still roughly. is still producing the same amount, right. whether I'm sleeping, right. awake, or whatever. It's it's producing. Well, it's, if it's going into quantum, quantum, it may not be going into quantum superposition when you're sleeping. It only goes into a quantum, a quantum state when it has external stimuli that drives it into that quantum state. Yes, although dreaming may also occur. I think dreaming in the subconscious is quantum superposition. In fact, in this model, before collapse, what do you have? You have quantum superposition. That's the pre-conscious, which may be the subconscious, okay? okay. The Freudian subconscious or the dream state or something like that. And, for example, dreaming is very much, in some ways, like quantum superposition. You have multiple possibilities coexisting. You have deep, deep connections. You have distortions of reality. You have t time, funny things with time. You have all things that are very... And, in fact, if you look at paintings that, that, that certain artists do that seem to come from the subconscious, you have the same sort of uh, surreal, uh, subconscious, uh, dreamlike qualities that are similar, I think, anyway, to quantum superposition of, of distorted reality, multiple possibilities, interconnectedness, and so forth. So maybe the, the, the subconscious or the preconscious is really quantum superposition conscious moment. But you can also get you know, elements of the subconscious out non-consciously in various ways. Were there experiences no. were sort of central <laughs> uh, drivers that you know, provided the motivation for you to get into this as in-depth as you have? Or could you even give us some general, you know, was it a, uh, I had a, 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 I was meditating and I had a transcendental experience that led me to believe that there's something far more than what we have here and, and this, you know, simplistic, mechanistic level. Or what, whatever it was, can you give us either, either general mm -hmm. or semi-specific? Right. I had some very powerful, intense, introspective experiences when I was younger that made me really wonder what was going on, what I was and what I was doing here and what everything was. And when I found myself in medical school, I was studying uh, cell division under the microscope, and I saw these microtubules pulling chromosomes apart, and I wondered how they knew what to do. And I got this idea that the same, whatever was in my consciousness was also occurring down there. And at that time, it was discovered that these same structures were also found in neurons, because prior to that, the fixative agent and electron microscopy had been dissolving them for many, many years. So when I, I discovered that these structures were in all cells, including neurons, I began to think that they were important for consciousness. And, but I was driven by, by my own uh, personal uh, intense curiosity from uh, my experiences earlier. Basic human question. I mean, would, would, would the general audience member um, be able to identify with, I mean, everybody seems to have the same question, what's the meaning of life and me right. and, and right. You know, what's going to happen to me when I die, what, where did I come from? Right. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's that, but it was amplified by right. experiences that, that basically, um, and you happened to be at the right place at the right time. You were studying this, these other right. phenomena right. and, and, and your age and everything else. Mm -hmm. Basically, you, you right. dug in, and so you've, you've been on that course. Right. And you're, you're, you're there today. And, right. Okay. <clears throat> My conclusion after all this is that consciousness is a self-organizing process at this fundamental level of the universe, that we are really the universe. We're a process occurring at this basic level. So we're connected to the universe, and we're also connected to each other because the universe has this property of non-locality. Everything's connected to everything. So it's kind of a spiritual thing because... Basically, we are a fundamental level of the universe, and at that level, there's all kinds of information, wisdom, if you will. Uh, the Buddhist universal mind, the Jungian collective unconscious, uh, platonic values, um, uh, things in the Kabbalah about wisdom and light. Uh, various religions and spiritual quests all have this idea of some greater universal truth, wisdom, connectedness, spirituality, call it God, call, call it what you will, that's part of the universe. And I think that this the physics of it take us down to this fundamental level and Penrose's work uh, describes how this information can be there and taken with quantum physics tells us how we can be connected to this level and how we can be connected to the universe and to each other 
and that the universe is in some sense alive and in some sense proto-conscious, really, and has been probably since the Big Bang. Of those experiences that you had that, that were sort of the, the driving motivators that gave you the, the intent and the intensity to maintain this pursuit, where many probably have just given up and gone off and, and, and you know, um, designed video cameras or something <laughs> far, far simpler. Uh, I mean, what, what, what were some of those events, if you could even tell us any of them? Well, I kind of kept to my, uh, my quest uh, because I was in a, uh, in a field, anesthesiology, which allowed me to study consciousness. And, uh, you know, I'm a clinical anesthesiologist, so every day I put my patients to sleep, and I still wonder, you know, where do they go? Okay. And that makes me wonder, why are they there in the first place? And what consciousness really is? And when they wake up and they're talking to me, it's, you know, even though it's routine, it's also still marvelous. And I think, uh, actually, anesthesia is one of the great inventions of the last thousand years, when you think about it. And what anesthetics do, what the gases do anyway, is get into the brain and work by very delicate quantum mechanical forces, suggesting that consciousness itself is a quantum quantum process. So that allowed me to study this while pursuing an academic career and earning a living as, a, as an anesthesiologist. So I was fortunate in that, and plus the fact that in doing it this way, I didn't have to follow traditional paths. I didn't have to be cubbyholed so I could get grants, so I could be in any discipline, so I could get approval from people by, by doing the predictable type of thing. I could be a maverick and follow what intuitively I thought was the right thing. And I'm very fortunate for that. Academic freedom is a great thing, and it's allowed me to, to come to this point. And, uh, you know, I, I get criticized a lot because it's a radical idea. I'm a maverick. Uh, Roger's a maverick. But, you know, I think it's far greater to be criticized and ignored. And the fact that, that we annoy people who have conventional approaches is, is, is actually kind of cool. Well, I think that, you know, the general audience is, is very happy that someone's willing to, you know, have the courage to, to, to move forward, you know, without uh, trying to protect themselves so much that they don't move anywhere. You know, um, I think that, that, that generally, um, maybe not in the scientific community where there's lots of prestige to be maintained and funding and, re you know, but, but everyone else is really happy when there's a major breakthrough. When the Wright brothers create an airplane, we're all like, you know, geez, sorry that they had to go through so much hell from that particular community, but, you know, the result is of benefit to everyone. And so um, you've got a lot of supporters, I think, well, thank you. In, yeah. the, in, the world, in the wide world. But, uh, what about people with near-death near experiences that, that claim to go into the white light? Do you think that they're going into that, meaning the palette, in fact, does not have different color paints. It just has this big, it's just a big bucket of white. And they go in, and this is, in fact, where all the colors are. I mean, is that you think something that might? Uh, what do you think? Of, what's your explanation for for what happens to them? The uh, there have been several studies recently about near death experiences in, in Europe, and uh, those descriptions are very uh, re repetitive. P patients people do say, say the that. same. And they also at least occasionally say that they float out of their body and mm -hmm. can can describe things from above and may float out, float out to the waiting room and have a sense of calm and they may visit uh, you know their their deceased relatives and this sort of thing. And uh, my explanation for that is that consciousness is actually a process in fundamental space-time geometry. Okay? It's at the very, very basic level of the universe. Now, normally, it's in the space-time geometry you know, between our ears, in mm -hmm. the microtubules in our neurons. But when the, they stop working, when the metabolic drive, the blood flow, the oxygen the, uh, is, is stopped and the acid builds up, and the coherent pumping of the microtubules driving the quantum coherence stops, the quantum information isn't lost, it just kind of leaks out to the universe at large in space-time geometry, it's still there. So you when clinical death occurs, no, no neurons are firing, nothing's happening. Right. And yet, when the person comes back from that, somehow their memories are maintained, everything's still there, they're still themselves. Well, the near-death experience is curious for several reasons, because uh, patients report uh, awareness that seems to be occurring when their brain's not working. Right. And clinically, uh, doctors would say it's impossible because, you know, the brain's not functioning. They can't, they can't be having awareness at that time. Which proves then that, the, that consciousness is not just occurring on, on the neuron level or the, you know, the classical synaptic level. Well, I think it proves that, but, you know, skeptics come up with different types of explanations. But what I think happens, as I said, is that the quantum information leaks out into the uh, space-time geometry at large. You may think that it's going to dissipate and spread out and be lost, but because of quantum entanglement, it, it tends to stay together, at least for a while, and can sort of hover. And when the body, uh, you know, when the patient is resuscitated and the blood flow is resumed, and if too much damage hasn't been done, it resumes, uh, returns to, to the brain. 
and uh, which raises the question of what happens if the patient does not is not revived? Does that is that the soul? Does it go off indefinitely into the universe?